I'm Chris Turner, and this is the Empowered Parent Podcast. So we're continuing our conversation with Jelana Goebel. Welcome back, everyone. Hey, Hello, Chris. Jelana. Thank you. Christopher. Brian. Okay. So, so I was actually thinking about this because the only time, like, like Chris and I are actually friends. This isn't the only time we talk. And I only refer to you as Christopher on the podcast. And, I yes. will, and, and I want, I'm going to try to figure that out. <laughs> Sounds formal. Sound of re- sound Maybe of it's because you're on a well, microphone. You feel like formal. Hello, Christopher. What, what's, <laughs> what's funny is that when usually when people refer to me as Christopher, I know they don't know me. Oh, mm. darn it. Oh. I, I, okay. Like you know, if I get a phone call and they ask for Christopher, like yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is definitely a spam not. call. To uh, you try to sell me something, right? I don't want to talk to you. Um, so funny. The only people when I was growing up that referred to me regularly as Christopher was my next door neighbor Cheryl, who was a whole ten months older than I uh, than I was or am, um, and my grandmother. <laughs> Yeah, That's like literally, like there was there was people who, ends of the who regularly referred to me as Christopher. So I, my grandmother's thinking was, I don't care if everyone else calls him Chris. His given name is Christopher, and that's how I'm going to refer to him. I think that's she, a grandmotherly thing to do. Yeah. To go by I, the full given name? Yes. I think they think that it's like almost wrong to not call them by their given name. But, but, but like th- ours, our littlest one is Liberty. Yeah. And she actually gets really mad because we always we've always called her Libby. And so when people call her Liberty, she thinks she's in trouble because that's what happens when she gets into she's trouble. She even said, that's not my name. And she'll say, that's not my name. Why does she keep calling me Liberty? And so I have to remember, like, when I sign her up for things to put Libby on it, because if I sign her up as Liberty, she gets really embarrassed because, like, Liberty, what? even though she likes, I said, do you not like your name? She's like, no, I like it. I just, that's not my name. That's what, that's what you call me when I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, what was interesting is, is now, um, I, I do like, I like video chat. I love the promise of it from back to the future too, where Marty <laughs> McFly was speaking to whatever the character's name was played by flea from the red hot chili peppers <laughs> in the house. And so I've always like, like wanted to live in that world. And now that we live here and now that everybody's zooming all the time, the vast majority of my meetings are, are teleconference instead of just telephone call. Yeah. And so I was on a, uh, on a video call with, um, with uh, our friends, Matt and Jen Waller from the, the attic foster care network in, in Midland today. And so Libby came in there and, and so the story about her naming Liberty and Libby, um, mm-hmm. and of course they're Matt and Jen, not Matthew and Jennifer. And mm-hmm. so that came up and I said, you know, in the midst of that conversation that in our house, Kayla either refers to me as honey or babe. But if she calls me Ryan, <laughs> it is like my mother referred to me as Ryan Lance North. I'm like, uh oh, what yes. have I done wrong now? Usually it's just because he didn't he didn't answer when I said mm-hmm. honey or babe. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm like, honey, babe, sweetie, Ryan North. And he's like, uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's funny. Yeah, I don't think that's what Jelana wants to talk about. No. Oh, no. no. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I feel like it's, it's very similar in my household, too, when I actually say my husband's name. Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, so, that's so, so, funny. Uh, so, you know, your husband has the same uh, issue that I have, and that's a four-letter name. Uh, yeah. And so it's really hard. To- is, that, is that his given name, or is it short for Lucas? No, his name is Luke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Luke. well, there you yeah, go. Just like the doctor from the Bible. Uh, and, and so, and so, he, you know, you really have to, because uh, it's not like Christopher, right? You got you got syllables to work with there. You can do all tons of things in the inflection and, so. and hard syllables too, yes. right? Yeah. You got hard consonants there. That you can, yes, yeah. So, so, what, so, what do you usually call Luke at home? Oh, I, I probably, um, probably just babe. Honestly, that's yeah. like his, his, the yeah. substituting the one four letter, his real word for another. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Luke, Luke, which that's, means that's babe. That's us too. Babe, <laughs> right. honey, sweetie. Those are, right. those are my three. In, in yeah. Gobelese, Luke means babe. <laughs> babe, in, babe in, means ancient, Luke. in ancient in ancient Greek, yeah. Luke means babe. Yeah. You yeah. know what's funny about this? Before before we get to like business, to talking about serious stuff, um, <laughs> even though the four of you are on the screen here, when Kayla's talking, I find myself looking at her. I know. I'm trying really hard so not to turn my head to look at you guys in the room because but, it but looks really... But we're in the room. It's only natural to look at one another Eight, more six in the feet room. Apart. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. We're social distancing. Don't worry. 
Oh, that's funny. Chrissy is like six feet from us. Yeah. (laughs) It's a substantial chunk of wood uh, that this table is between us. Oh, my, my. um, You probably want to talk about real stuff, Chris. Well, I mean, I think that's what our listeners are kind of looking for. You don't think they want us to talk about names? We can keep talking about names, but... (laughs) One of the things that Jelada is heavily involved in is Embrace Oregon. And so how did that kind of come about for, for you? Um, so I had a conversation with my uh, one of my foster child's certifiers um, who just comes out to my house twice a year to make sure I have a certif- uh, fire extinguisher and all of those things yeah. to make sure my home is safe. And I just asked her, you know, what happens when a child is removed from his or her home environment for whatever reasons and is taken into a child welfare office? And she just painted this picture immediately of just scrambling each and every time. So I just started mm-hmm. doing the math in our Portland tri-county area of how many offices, how many kids are we talking And, um, I was really surprised that there was no protocol of anything for caseworkers to count on, you know, being able to hand to kids and nothing that kids were able to call their own in this most vulnerable time of waiting. So that's what started something called welcome boxes. And they are basically like those photo storage boxes that you can get at a craft store and they are Mm -hmm. filled to the brim with nightlight and flashlight, um, you know, for kids first few nights away, art supplies, snacks, books, just anything that would bring delight to a child and divided by age group. And so it's not like a rocket scientist idea, but it just was, um, I got a grant through my church that wanted to celebrate Christmas a little differently. And so they encouraged people to give towards this pot of money to um, fund kind of creative ideas for people within Mm. the church. And so I applied um, for a grant and got it for welcome boxes. And at that time, um, my child welfare office is one of nine in our Portland area. And I just asked staff there, like, how many kids do you anticipate will be walking through needing a box um, to call their own, knowing that a box is like, not going to solve Right. You know, like I'm thinking this is this is a small thing. And yet for kids, just in the midst of not knowing, just to say these are all brand new items and I don't know where I'm going, but I know everything in this box is mine. And then on the mm-hmm. lid of every box, there's just an, an encouragement like you matter, mm-hmm. you're special, um, mm-hmm. uh, you're worth it something along those lines. And I actually connected with my 11 year old um, bio mom who grew up in foster care. And I just said, Jennifer, is this, is this cheesy? I mean, if you're like a 12 year old girl waiting in the office and you Mm. open up a a box and on the lid, it says you are loved. Are you like, Oh my gosh. She said, actually, those are things that I never really heard. So even if it's on the lid of a box and that moment of vulnerability, I feel like I could receive it. So it was cool Mm. to have her input. And yeah. really that's kind of what started the embrace organ wave. We, we say on our team, it was like this slow little trickle that turned into this flood because pretty soon it wasn't about, um, well, I set my goals really small and that was about as big as I was thinking at the time, 300 mm-hmm. for my local child welfare office. And then when we blew through that, I got permission to put them in every office in the Metro area. And then pretty soon it was just this catalyst that God used for people to begin to say, how can my Sunday school, my business, Mm. my family, my, um, you know, whatever, my Girl Scout troop, what can, can we do a welcome box? And so it was this Mm. like humble catalyst, I think that was used for people to begin asking like, okay, why do, why is there kids in our community that need a box to begin with? Mm -hmm. And it also, um, invited people to do something for local kids in their community, um, that they could put together, that they could personalize for about $25. And so it caught on really quickly with churches Mm -hmm. and businesses and individuals in the area. And then from there, people started saying, well, what else, what else can I do to help? And that's where we just had this whoosh of, of, um, 
involvement and interest. And so I started leading tours of child welfare offices, really believing that most people in the community are driving by them, having no earthly idea of what a child welfare office is or what Mm -hmm. the point of it is or what's happening in that office. And so just with some natural relationships that I had as a foster parent began offering um, tours, cold calling, cold calling even like some area churches that were surrounding those office and really thought, what would the community look like if every child welfare office didn't have this idea of community being some like nebulous term? You know, we talk about like we value community, but at the end of the day, when you're a large government agency and you talk about community, what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. And so to have, you know, the area to, to be very geographically focused these families, these churches, these businesses, this is your child welfare office. And you are going to be warmly welcomed and you are going to have a tour where you're going to meet folks. And we're going to just, I'm just going to be a catalyst to connect. Um, From there, we started doing makeovers of child welfare offices. A lot of these places looked very shabby and uninspiring. Mm -hmm. And just recognizing that physical environment can communicate dignity and worth and value. And for these parents, as you well know, that are in the pit of addiction and whatever it is that they're trying to do to go through their services to um, regain custody of their children, that gosh, if they're only seeing them one or two hours a week, that they need to have dignity and worth and value spoken over them in environment. So churches and groups and businesses came in and just did these amazing makeovers, almost like move that bus type, like makeovers, you know, these $60,000 makeovers over the course of a long weekend. Um, you know, where the entire office, every visitation room was Mm. just completely redone. And, you know, just having the, the, the idea from the moment families walk in the lobby to when they're visiting with their child, that is sacred time and they deserve the best of the best. And so now Mm -hmm. that we've been uh, this was in, started in 2013. Oh, and then there was a um, there was an article that was printed in the paper um, called "A Revolution in Portland's Foster Care," mm. and it was really about welcome boxes and about these makeovers. And then that just kind of sealed the deal in terms of being off to the races. But yeah, over well over half million dollars has been poured in 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 kind donations in our Portland metro area by churches, businesses, and individuals. Um, We have done over 75 makeovers statewide. And really like the makeovers are great, but I feel like um, a, a a lot of churches are really good at short episodic cosmetic things. And so really yeah. it's like, how can we use this tool to get people in the door to understand what's going on behind the walls and then invite them into a deeper engagement? Yeah. So that's really where, you know, we're trying to show hospitality to staff. It's not always been popular, but I firmly stand by it. Um, and I think that that's been part of the buy-in from child welfare is feeling like they know who their community is And then we are regularly showing hospitality to them saying, thank you. We know this is a really hard job. Do I have on rosy colored glasses that every single person in that office is deserving of like a robust thank you? Absolutely not. But for the most part, when we look at like, what is the task that they have, this overwhelming, impossible task, and what is the job of of the church or even those in society that just believe vulnerable children should be well cared for, regardless of what belief is driving someone, um, you know, these are the people that are doing it. And so how can we, how can we say thank you? And I think that very humble thank you has been like water being poured into this like dry, thirsty ground. And, Mm. and regardless of how people have felt about the faith community, I've heard over and over again, um, staff say, you guys, you know, y- you've stayed. Like, we can't deny that, like, you're the ones that have stayed by our side. And I think when stuff hits the fan um, and horrible things are are in our newspaper about child welfare that can be very deserving, um, it, there's a lot of power in connecting people, people just seem to be a little, little less like pointing the finger of like, wow, what evil people. And to say, you know what? Wow, like there are some real things that need to be addressed here, but I also know Sherry and Russ and Karen at my local child welfare office, and mm-hmm. I believe that their hearts are good. And it's just amazing yeah. the amount of um, trust that has been 
that has been developed and people actually knowing people on the inside and then having community standing with them on the outside. So you're putting through, a face to a faceless bureaucracy. Exactly. And making them exactly. accessible. You're humanizing. You're humanizing That's them, exactly yeah. what I was thinking yeah. when yeah. you were telling that story. Exactly. Uh, and so from there, you know, it's just been really connecting with leaders at every level from the top, from the, those mm. at the legislature to those, you know, in the Capitol to, to the leaders in the field um, on the ground level. And just basically saying like, how can we serve you? And with that posture, we also have to recognize we, we can't be everything to everyone. So we've had to right. really say, who are we? What are we about? We are about hospitality through, I mean, the welcome boxes was one thing. Now we have like seven or eight different boxes that people can put together, encouragement for foster families, encouragement for those aging out, you know, all these different things. Um, but hospitality, um, we have churches that are giving goodies on a once a month basis or mm -hmm. leaving notes of encouragement on child welfare uh, staff's desk. Um, we are about really unusual volunteer opportunities, kind of driving in new lanes. One of those is our office buddy program. Mm, um, I love this. And yes. yeah, it's, it's a uh, allowing people to meet with, um, wait with kids in this really vulnerable time of waiting, like a box is great, but let's take it to the next level. Like they're still often in the cubicle overhearing, um, what's being said about them. And so how, right. you know, how can we have people show presence? Um, we are really intentional about our storytelling. And with that, I mean, just trying to break down, break down the barriers to basically say, we can do this at one another, or we can kind of like shoulder in and lean in and see what can be accomplished collectively. Um, and then lastly, we're just about raising awareness, fully recognizing that this is not a, like, let's sound the trumpet and have everybody step up to be a foster family. We right. know that that's disastrous and people <laughs> will be ill-equipped ill and it's yeah. just, you know, not signing anyone up for success. And yet at the same time, we do have a real need for more foster families. So continuing to put in front of um, in front of the community, what the dream scenario is that there wouldn't be kids waiting in an office for a family, but that one day in Oregon, in the United States, there would actually be a long list of families waiting for their turn to step up, to have the yeah. privilege of fostering, being really well-trained and all of that. So that, so that our partners at child welfare, aren't just pairing a roof over a child's head, which we all know just leads to burnout on both right. sides. Right. But can actually say, what are these child's unique needs? And what is this foster's family's unique capabilities and strengths to meet this child's specific yeah. needs? So but that's not the just dream scenario. Whoever, whoever happens to, you know, be available, answer the phone, <laughs> answer, answer the, the phone, phone. Yeah. say <laughs> right. yes at well, that right. moment. Right. And they can actually, you know, give a little more thought right. to the pairings. Yeah, right. no, that would be, that so, would be an amazing day in foster uh, care. Yeah, I, I just it wanted to be. say something about, about, um, about what you said, Jelana, and that is early on uh, in, in you talking about the genesis of Embrace Oregon, mm -hmm. um, you used the word dignity. Mm-hmm. And, and I just absolutely love that word dignity because it made me think of Mother Teresa, right? That was that was her miss, mi mission when she went to Calcutta that people would die with dignity, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the, originally what she wanted wanted to do is help people die with dignity. And mm -hmm. so putting some humanity and some dignity into the situation um, is just so 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 good. It sounds it sounds kind of simple when you just speak speak it really quickly out of your mouth. But but the long the, the impacts, right? When you talk about you know how your body responds, to how a person responds to trauma, one of the things that that is compromised is that belief system mm. that that, mm -hmm. that that the child has, and then that child with a compromised belief system becomes an adult mm -hmm. who has a compromised belief system. But if you can restore dignity back to that person. I just think that is such a beautiful part yeah. of the recovery story, and um, you know when we when we learned about about the office buddies, um, mm -hmm. that's not what you call them office buddies, but that the buddy program where somebody comes and sits with a kid while 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 the caseworker is trying to find a placement for them. I mean, I cannot I can't imagine how damaging it is to be removed from your home because maybe you were treated violently, or or, or you were neglected, like nobody took care of you in the home. You're removed from that home. And then you have to sit in a chair and hear somebody talk about parts of your story and then say, okay, well, that family wasn't interested in taking placement today and then just have to deal with 
you know, another rejection on, on that day. And I think that that yeah. is just such a beautiful thing that you guys do up there. Um, and, and, and we're starting to hear from around the country now that, that other, other, other organizations are starting to do similar things. Uh, and I just think that's amazing because, you know, what, what I love about you and, 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 and everything you're involved in up there, um, the, there's, it never comes across as, okay, we're doing this to try to, as a springboard to this. What mm-hmm. you did is we're going to address the need that's in front of us and it has grown because you've been faithful to that task. And now, you know, um, when, 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 when the pandemic hit, the governor's office called you guys and said, look, how are we going to respond to this crisis? Because, mm-hmm. because I, I believe you, you were faithful in, in the little thing that was in front of you all those years ago. And it has just been blessed and shaken up and multiplied mm-hmm. because you were faithful to the task. It, it's honestly been, it feels like I'm living the front row seat of like a mustard seed story, honestly, yeah. is, is what it, and it, I feel so privileged um, to just be a part of it. I, I really do believe that had we had this like glossy binder and 10 year plan with all these bullet points, mm. we very well wouldn't be where we are today. It has been yeah. such a, a, a God story of just this, taking the small offering and then just, um, you know raising it up. I think uh, several years ago, uh, child welfare approached us in the Metro area and just said, you know, other offices or other regions are really wanting what they've deemed this community mobilization effort. You know, these four pillars that I talked about, Mm -hmm. um, would you consider doing work in some other communities? And so we actually didn't have the staff for that. We're still a very small staff comparatively for all that we strive to do. Um, but really getting comfortable in like, what is our lane? You know, there's always going to be a lot of good ideas and there's always Mm going to be a lot of projects that are worthy to be done, but just are not what is ours to do. Right. So we feel pretty dialed in with the hospitality and the, you know, different volunteer on ramps and being intentional about telling stories and raising up, um, raising up foster parents that are, that are equipped. Um, and so we got a grant to scale to all 36 counties, um, with an effort, we, we've named it Every Child, which is kind of our statewide work. And um, it's, it's just been incredible. And I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm on the team still. I'm part-time. I feel really humbled and privileged to still um, be here. I adore my colleagues. This work is thrilling to me. And um, the work has... Uh, the work has gone forward one, because I believe that we've just had straight up favor. Um, and, yeah. and two, because there's a lot of really talented leaders who are just sprinting in this lane and giving it their all. And, um, so I just feel grateful to still be a part of things, but in terms of like continuing to really push the momentum forward, mm-hmm. there are others on our team that are really doing it. And then I think I'm just still always trying to discern like, well, as a foster parent now for 17 years, not continuous, but from yeah. when I started till now, I'm still a certified foster parent, although we will never take um, a long-term placement again, but we have helped with like short-term shelter. I just am really thinking like, what is, what is mine? to do now. And so I have the privilege of engaging with a lot of families who are often in crisis because they didn't receive the support that, Mm -hmm. that, um, the training that, that you guys offer, um, and the support to, to do this for the long haul. And so we're always trying to think like, how can we help, um, how can we help churches and individuals and families? And that's such a huge reason why we had you both out your training was such a hit. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it was, it's so refreshing to be able for you guys to be able to understand the nuance with which we speak that we, you know, our team is comfortable speaking to the legislature and to churches and from pastors to business leaders and from DHS staff to whoever. And so I just feel like it's, it's, it was so refreshing for you guys to just it's so clear that you are in your, in your world, like pivoting to be able to give really good information, but in a way that people can best receive. And I so appreciated Mm -hmm. that about both of you coming out and being able to give a, a 
a training for church ministry leaders and then turn around and do a training for just the community at large, which included a lot of our DHS child welfare partners. Um, and that's really, you know, where we strive, strive to be just a connector at the end, at the end of the day. Well, um, I appreciate you mentioning our trip up there in, in 2018, you know, um, so we, we made, we recorded that children's ministry training and, um, and churches can purchase it now and, you know, subscribe to it and have access to it on an annual basis. We have more churches in the state of Oregon who have taken, who have taken our video based training on trauma informed care in churches than any other state in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and it's not just around Portland. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's around the state. Um, we, we, we get, we get like emails and, and messages from folks. Um, we met somebody, 10 days ago who said, Hey, I was there that day. You guys uh, mm -hmm. trained up there in the audience and we just, you know, just loved it. And so, you know, we have such fond memories of our time in, in Oregon. I, you know, on the previous episode you're on with us, we talked a little bit about that, but, but just, um, yeah, just, just really, really nice people who are just, you know, down to earth and committed actually to, to helping the children. And it was just, um, I don't know. It was just so so refreshing for us to be up there and to be with you guys, and and it was such a great um, learning experience for, for us. I remember um, when you know we 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 flew in and we went from the airport to meet with you and and Brooke and and mm -hmm. getting in the car, and and Kayla and I looking at each other and go, "Wow, those are two impressive people." You know, we were just just so 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 so. Um, thrilled to learn of the work up there and and just the whole sort of hey it's it's just what we do kind of kind of attitude about it because at the end of the day it is just what you do right and mm -hmm. yeah. and so many so many kids and families have been blessed by it and and we certainly um consider it a privilege personally that that you would call us your friends well, likewise, and we we really promote you. I mean, I think the the beauty with our Every Child Network now being all across Oregon is that when something when when we in the Portland area discover something really good and we're sharing, and vice versa, we're able to like send it out to the whole network, and yeah. we're able to, you know, all the the churches and and folks that are with us, we're able to just pump out. Yeah, we met somebody who work. works with you recently, um, Vanessa. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. she's a colleague of mine. Yeah, she, she, boy, we, 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 um, she spoke very highly of you. So, so you must be nice to the people you work with as well as the people. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but no, I really, I really love it, and I think you know, to be, to be frank, I think, um, because our home life, because choosing foster care, and because the road of adoption is so worthy and yet so difficult some days. I just feel really grateful to still have the privilege of being able to be a part of this team mm -hmm. because sometimes when home is hard, work can feel a little bit like inverted respite. Mm -hmm. um, and it just feels, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just thrilling. So um, it's good to be, it's good to be with my family. It's also great to still be yeah. still be working yeah. and um, sometimes I, still be a part of it. I, I feel sometimes, you know, at home, we're not, yeah, I always tell people, I'm like, I'm really good with other people's kids and telling other people <laughs> how to do things with their kids. And yeah. then when it comes to my kids, I like, I, sometimes I just feel like I forget everything that I know oh, and I, know. I go back to, you know, square one. And so sometimes it's I get real. what you're saying. It's like, I can zone in on helping other people and their children and I can zone out of helping my own children, hey. which is a terrible thing to say. Well, it is. But, it's a terrible know. thing when we put it like that. But I think in some ways, I'd, li I'd like to think, I'd like to reframe that, Kayla, and think that, like, that, like, uh, that you know, just being able to kind of have a fit in both worlds helps yeah. me to be a more present mom. I, I do think so. And we were just telling some people that we, you know, we're, we're teaching. reframed, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're teaching a we have an online class that we're teaching right now and so we just finished week four and we were talking in the class and one of the moms was sharing just that they had been you know doing these things for a while but even mm -hmm. you know just hearing some of the things again at a different yeah. stage in parenting was really helpful to them and we said you know for us too like we're constantly reading and learning and 
and listening to other people because we need people to speak in to us. Yeah. And I've even recently, my son walked in the room and he was laughing because I was sitting listening to one of our podcast episodes. And he's like, are you listening to your own podcast? And I was like, I don't remember what we said, but I really need to know what we said because I'm sure in the moment, I feel yeah. like God gives us those words that are yeah. what we need. And sometimes I even need to hear some of those things again, just to so remind true. myself, you know? And Me so yeah. it was funny though, because he walked to the room and he was, I was actually preparing for teaching something. And I was like, what should I say about this? Let me go back to this podcast episode and see what we, what we said. And he, he just laughed though. Cause he's like, that's hey, your own podcast. Hey, hey Kayla, uh, I, I, we're probably going to, going to land the plane here pretty quick in a few minutes, but I just wanted to say this, that you realize that I have an audio editor. Oh, I know how to use it. And you just said, I am really good at telling other people what to do with their kids. <laughs> And I think I'm just going to clip that and say, I'm really good at t- telling other people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and chop off the with their kids. Yeah, so and, and it just like, makes me sound bossy. I mean, there's you, your you ring- threw it yeah, out me. there. There's your I new ringtone mean- when your wife calls you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That would be hilarious. You threw it out there. I'm just oh, saying. my gosh. And- but, I, but I hear what you're saying, Kayla. <laughs> I, I do. I feel like that, you know, that's why, like, I and other members of my team, like, signed up for your trauma mastering your trauma master class. Yeah. What was it called? Yes. Specifically? Yes. Illuminate. Yes. Illuminate. Is yeah. What yes. Yeah. Yes. And so I just feel like we, we all need to keep, keep, um, our parenting skills yes, fresh because absolutely. some of the stuff that is, is literally thrown my way. Yes. Um, I need to literally <laughs> need to <laughs> literally throw my way. I need to, oh. you know, just, just know, like we're not alone. I think yeah. there, there's so much so much power in that and just knowing that that we're not alone yeah. and, and then also having you know a directional arrow of like you're not alone and here's some this next is steps. where you go and yeah. none of us totally have this dialed in 100 yeah. well, 24 hours a day a long and so th- i think that's where it's so good to be able to lean lean on others and to just be able to vulnerably share and laugh and cry yeah. and and just say, wow, this is this is more beautiful and harder and messy mm-hmm. and joyful and heartachey and kind of all of these all things the stumbled into time. one. Yeah, I think uh, along those lines, you know, I told somebody today that that being having to teach this material uh, on a weekly basis um, mm. has made me a better parent because yeah. I'm conf- because even when I'm hearing myself talk about it. I'm hearing myself talk about it, right? right. And so yeah. it's almost like there's a self-teaching that goes on. But then the flip of it is, is I think we become more vigilant about actually being the parents that we talk about, because it isn't just um, it isn't just that we learned some things or read some books or were educated. It's it's the actually having to put this into practice that we figured out the nuances of it. Um, and so when, when we, when we make some changes, when we try new things and they start to work, we really double down on those things now, because at the end of the day, I want to be able to look, look at myself in the mirror every morning when I'm brushing my teeth and not, and not feel like I say one thing and we do another thing. Now, do we get it right all the time? Absolutely not. My friend, Chris Turner across the table can, can testify to that, (laughs) but, but I think what, what we what we have to do is that we have to when we fail, get up, dust ourselves off, and, and try again. Or more to the point, have somebody else pull us back up, dust mm-hmm. us off. Yeah. Um, you know, and and over the years, Kayla and I have been gotten a lot better at this. In the in the part of our marriage deal is is I have the same permission that she has, and that is if we're heading in the wrong direction with the kids, um, the 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 non in the non dialed in spouse gets to tell the other spouse, hey, I think you need to tap out because you're really struggling. And our deal is that yeah. if if some version of that alarm bell is sound, um, you're not allowed to to put, brush that aside. Um, and yeah. if you do, you have to apologize after it once, <laughs> once you're in your right state yeah. of mind because we've made that deal. And, you know, and that works about 95% of the time. It probably works a lot more than I ever thought it would. Hmm. Um you know, Kayla's mostly great when I tell her that. No, it's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We're no, doing I mean, a video but I think it's too. but I think it's so you know interesting when we have kids that flip their lids all the time 
to, yeah. for, you know, when Luke is, we have a, a very similar agreement and it's like, do not call me off right now. No, I am finished it. You know, and to realize like, oh, my lid is flipped. I really do need to like to step out of the yes. situation yes. to just realize like, there's just a human, there's just a human element yeah. to all of this. Right. You know, there's, yeah, there's a human element and we just need to know ourselves, um, really well. And, and it's a gift at the end of the day yeah. well, to have somebody else to, to shoulder tap us, even if it doesn't always feel like that in the moment. Yeah. Well, it's, it's <laughs> that having a plan for those moments because they're going to happen, mm-hmm. you know? And right. so as long as we have right. a plan and say, okay, this is going to happen. We are mm-hmm. going to, you know, have a moment when we melt down, we are going to have a moment when, you know, we don't respond correctly. And as long as we have that plan, in place ahead of time than in the moment it's not so hard yeah okay. well, one one last thing um you you notice how much i'm i'm on board with with oregon here that i'm wearing a nike, <laughs> oh, nike, yes, logo, a nike t-shirt, t-shirt for for you to be oh, on this today okay there you go see and they didn't even pay for that endorsement but if they would like to <laughs> they can email us at info at one big happy home dot com. <laughs> nice segue oh, that was good nice. i do what that i can good. That was good. Uh, when we posted about um, our new patreon community and we were like we're committed to keeping it ad free and we only advertise oh, yeah. those things we actually use in our home so since he's wearing well, the shirt we i actually mean use nike products so yeah there, you go. there was no payment that was received for that <laughs> endorsement either <laughs> You're probably That's meander hilarious. away from the, the big athletic sportswear company. <laughs> okay, I'll stop talking. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I hope that uh, our listeners have been as encouraged as I have been by listening to the story of Embrace Oregon. Um, you know, it, it's something that looks really big now, but didn't start that way. Like you, know, like you said earlier, Jalada, uh, yeah. sometimes all you need is is a baby step. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're, you're leaping from tree to tree. So they have a uh, lot of trees in Oregon. Oregon. (laughs) That's very topical. Hey, um, just, uh, just to tack onto that, Chris, um, there's, I'm not a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, but, but I'm enough of a fan to know some enough of the songs. And he has a song. Um, and it goes, the chorus goes from small things, mama, big things one day come. Mm. And I absolutely love that song because, um, there is, there, there, there is, there is so much truth wrapped up in, in that lyric and as evidenced by the story Jelana just shared. Yeah. Mm. So if you're listening to this, um, in the regular podcast stream, you're probably a few months behind its release or a few weeks or however long we decided. <laughs> a few somethings. <laughs> a few somethings. <laughs> uh, because this uh, originally was posted uh, to our Patreon subscribers only. And we encourage you to join us there if you'd like to hear episodes like this a little sooner. You can go to patreon.com slash empowered parent. As always, you can find our podcast in any of the usual locations, the iTunes store, Google Play store, and Spotify. We're on all three. The Empower Parrot podcast is. Ah, you okay, you keep going. This I'm is live video, my friend. It. I got I to gotta have it up. I can't remember the line. You know, I, I, I love this. For, for a long time, I've been encouraging everybody that we need to capture this live. Uh, and so now everybody gets to see. How we do a, a read? How the sausage is we made. Do, we're gonna do. We're gonna do some connective. Yeah. Chris, would you like to try that again? I would try like to try again. that again. <laughs> the Empowered Parent Podcast is committed to helping parents of foster and adopted kids through connecting, correcting, and empowering principles. Thanks everybody for listening. 